Hey, Peter. Hey, Mike. How you doing? Good. I think I might have started this. I'm a co-host, and I might have actually started this <laughs> thing. I don't know if I let people into the room or not. Who knows? Well, um, Stu Goldman is in, so I guess he's there. But no, usually what happens is in the top of the screen, it shows that somebody wants to get in, then you just approve it. Okay. Um, I'm going to let Maggie worry about that. When she okay. I'm surprised <laughs> she's not here yet. Um, I saw them. I saw them half an hour ago. They're they They know about it. All right. Great. Um, well, welcome. It's uh, so fun. Definitely uh, fun. Well, are we going to see you here? Are you coming by? Yeah, I'm going to come out to um, Connecticut, uh, Hartford. Okay, fantastic. And then, and then I went to head back out to um, Baltimore. Okay, great. So Excellent. Catch those games. Very good. Good. Yeah. Looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, un unbelievable. Yep, it's a lot of fun. Wait, you know what? Let me close this curtain behind me. Because this is a little different. There we go. It'll be, oh, actually, no, wait a second. Maybe I should, maybe I should put this light on. There we go. Oh, that, way, that works good. Yeah. Maybe you almost, look, you almost look better than a South, you know? There we go. Man, you've done a few of these before, haven't you? Uh, yes, never in my hotel room, but... Uh, I've definitely done a few, quite a few. At my home, I uh, I have it all set up, so it's okay. Yeah, Asaf, let's see. You need, let's see your haircut. Are you getting a, getting a haircut before all this stuff happens? <laughs> yeah, Gail, I need Galen to come and give me a haircut. He yeah. still uh, still hasn't showed up. Well, Peter and I are jealous. Okay. <laughs> That's right, definitely. Here, Maggie's the host now. There she is. You're on. You're on mute. Maggie, I don't know if I accidentally started the whole thing. I, I clicked a button. It's fine. That, You're also a host. It's fine. It's good. Okay. But are people going to be able to just to come in at any time? Uh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do it, Adam. We don't need people. Yeah. All right. I'm going to do a oh, there we go. Uh, sound check here. Hold on. How is this going to work? Can you hear this? Yes. Inspirational. Great. Um, Wide world of sports. Yeah. You know that there was an Israeli who uh, who produced that program. Really? Yep. Oh. Guy in the 1960s. How did I do this before? Well, it wasn't screen share. He designed the program. The wide no, world no, he, he was part of the original Wide World of Sports uh, production team um, that had the idea for Wide World of Sports. He's actually Israel's representative to the IOC. Now, to the IOC. Um, he's, a, he's a bit of an asshole and he doesn't like baseball very much, but uh, he was for many years, he was living in the States. Is he still alive? Yeah, he's about uh, in his uh, late, early 80s or so. Okay. Not so old. Yeah. <laughs> so is he more supportive of baseball now that we've, shown that we can make it all the way no no, no not really well no unless he's supportive of us i can't say he's not supportive but uh i've got my problems with him but that's that, that's besides the point <laughs> okay well um this will our objective is to have a lot of fun over the next 50 minutes i i really don't know how many folks you know that just so happens this hap this is a working day so a lot of people are working right but I'm hoping that um, the recording of this will get out. And um, if, if it, I, I have a hunch we'll have at least 50 people. I, I was okay. hoping for twice that, but the recording might have some legs. Um, Listen, every day a few hundred dollars comes in from you because I see it going to Mitch's. I, I get all, I get an email from the JNF every day of what donations came in. Okay. So I see them all going to Mitch's uh, uh, platform. They? Good. So that's, no, it's nice. You know, well, that's good. So Good. Um, it's, uh, you know, like I w wake up and I'm like, oh my God, I didn't tell so-and-so about this. I didn't tell so-and-so. We keep thinking about people in our wider worlds. Sure. Um, so we have a hard cutoff at 220 or 320 your time. Yes, correct? exactly. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to try to keep us on schedule. I want to have, um, you know, the final minute to talk up the uh the team store um as a courtesy to zach rob who i know has been working hard on that is that good 
Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, definitely. Okay. And, um, but my friend Stu Goldman is on the call and he'll be moderating with us. Um, he's actually having a problem getting on because he's trying to log on. I see also Mitch is having a problem logging on. Uh oh. You can see both of them are like, uh, how come Maggie got on and Mitch hasn't gone on yet? <laughs> oh, oh, there's Shlomo. Shlomo, does your sound work? Okay. Check one. What? Check one, check one, two. What? <laughs> it's your room with the chewing tobacco, not mine. Don't worry, unlike Holtz, I'm gonna take it out before I... <laughs> Holtz's signature, is, signature move is... Exactly. <laughs> you can't do that in, in Japan. That's your secret weapon for longevity. Oh, Mitch is on. Mitch, can you can we hear you? Sound check. Sound check. All right, good. Now we just got to get Stu Goldman on. Sound in the background there. Maggie's doing sound in the background. Right, right. No, I see you. You're on two separate laptops, I guess. Is that working or no? Can you guys hear that? I heard something, but. Uh, Try it again. Sound is very difficult on uh, Zoom. So Shlomo, are you there? I'm here. I had I struggled. I had all my T-shirts ready for you. I, I have Bob Seeger. I don't know if you can see me. I think I remember uh, Mitch telling me that you're a uh, avid uh, music t-shirt collector. Yeah, every time I go, I, th my favorites are these guys. I, I went to three nights of Grateful Dead, Dead the last show and from 2015. Uh, uh, that was just so much fun. I've yeah. been to many, many Grateful Dead concerts. They're yeah. Amazing. <laughs> yeah? Oh, yeah? I have footage on uh, VHS of Peter Twirling <laughs> me twirling <laughs> yeah listen if you ever get my buddy bob weir to play at city winery you let me give me a couple weeks notice we right? actually we were very close doing some cool stuff with him for his uh fundraiser we will definitely be doing some stuff with weir once uh they finish their their next uh dead and co tour okay well that i um oh look at my me. god mitch what kind of presentation is this <laughs> I, I stayed up pretty late last night making this. And no, Maggie made it look good. I, I just have the basic content. Where did you and get this some morning, of those she really you know, Oh my God. Who's Jason you Rose? Some deep dive. <laughs> what is that? That's 1991. That's when you came to Israel? That's when I helped uh, Randy Kahn, who's right I there. I remember those t shirts. Sure. Wow. You, well, yeah. There's um, Randy with that New York Mets jacket. He, it's legendary. He used to wear that all the time. Yeah. And um, I had a, we were doing a mission. This is right before the Gulf War. <coughs> right, the, like two days before the Scuds came in. And we had a game at the YMCA field in Jerusalem on the soccer field with some Ethiopian kids. And wow. That's so where I did my basic training in the Israeli army. Yeah. In the Gulf War. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't born yet. Mm. Yeah. So, <laughs> you got to talk to Stu Goldman because he's not getting online. You should tell him to hang up and try to try it again. Yeah. But are there other people on here? Oh, there's 20 participants. They can hear yeah, us. I think, I think I started the meeting a little early. So uh, let's be careful of what we say here. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Okay. Hey, Mitch. <clears throat> so we're just, I guess, uh, waiting to get. Oh, Stu, are you on? He's still struggling here. Mike, maybe call up Stu on the phone and uh, tell him to uh, 
get off and then try to get on again. Yeah, I hope Stu's pretty adept at this. Okay. So how's the weather on the East Coast? Pretty bad. We did get an after, uh, morning practice in with no rain. OK, for those of you who are on the call, we, uh, pre we prematurely let you in. So uh, you're watching the the pregame arrangements being made. This is a real inside look at how a Team Israel Olympic videos are made. So you have real, real, real honor here for you guys to see this. We're gonna uh, watch a soft get a haircut. And what is your barber coming in a minute or what? No, he's coming in a week. It's an issue. <laughs> okay. I wish I would have got a haircut before this. Nah, you look good. You, you <laughs> remind us that. Uh, what it was like. So we're going to wait just a few more minutes and then um, and hopefully you get Stu Goldman on. Hi, Mike Glasser. Who's that? Stu. Hey, Stu, how are you? Good to, good to have you aboard. Are we live? We are live, and I actually started letting people in, and people are starting to enter. So um, anything you say will be heard by all of our wonderful guests. Um, so let's, we'll give it another minute or so. Yeah, and it, when it's time, if Maggie allows me to have video, that's fine. But I'm not that good looking, so you don't really have to have my video on. Well, you, you, you make us all look much better, though. That's why we like to have your picture on. Well, thank you. All right. Well, listen, why don't we, um, as people are coming into the room, um, I, I, let's handle some preliminary stuff. And so by the time folks are in, we're really talking about Team Israel today, but you know, I'd like to um, suspend a couple minutes with a little background. And uh, but before we do any of that, I, I'd like to, and before we introduce all of our panelists, I'd like to introduce my, our co-moderator, uh, Stuart Goldman, uh, who's a, uh, a, 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 a days that he's being responsible. He's a pediatric oncologist, but I, I like Stu on those days. He's irresponsible because I've been around him for many, many more of those. Um, but what qualifies Stu in, in being in helping me with moderate this panel today is that he, like many of you, are, are big fans of Mitch Glasser, um, probably more so than he is of Mike Glasser. But uh, Stu, would you like to offer a couple words? Yeah, I, I am ecstatic to be part of this. You know, um, speaking from the heart, uh, as a young man who is during my life journey sometimes felt more spiritually connected to Israel and my heritage and times when not as connected, this whole experience of watching Mitch and the entire Israeli baseball Olympic team go through the process of qualifying and meeting many of the players in past events has brought my pride um, to a, a top that it hasn't been in, in so many years. And that what you young men have done has really transcended just the game of baseball. It showed what some really terrific young people can do to represent a country, to represent yourself 
and to make us all proud. And as a, a baseball fan throughout my life, as a Jew, as an American, I could not be more proud of you. The only negative is that I now have to buy a new package for my TV so I can watch you guys during the Olympics. But uh, thank you so much. And I'm so proud of you. And you have already had a victory that can never be taken away just by what you've done so far. And I'm sure I speak for everybody on this webinar. We are really proud of you and we are behind you. Wow. You haven't spoken that eloquently since your bar mitzvah. So. <laughs> Thanks. Can you, uh, now we really want to see you. Do you know how to turn your camera on? It, it's on. It says that the host won't let me do that. All right. Well, I'll, it's okay. That's all right. Well, 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 thank you for all those great words. I initially thought we were going to um, open the room. And as people filter into the room, we were going to play music. Um, my first choice was, a, was the Hatikva, which is, of course, most of you know is a Jewish national anthem. And I just like to say that there's always a moment of pride before we go to an American game and hear the United States, the US national anthem, but there's nothing for me and I'm sure for nearly everybody in this room, including all the players, that's more emotional, that's, that just creates incredible sensation than hearing the Hatikva played while Team Israel is facing an opponent at a game. Um, I remember the first time I saw that happen was at the World Baseball Championship and the players took off their caps and they were all displaying kippahs. And hearing the power of that music with the significance of Israel competing on the world stage in the sport of baseball is an incredible thing. And, and, um, and I just wanted to make sure I said that. Um, so I can just show something from uh, 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 20 minutes ago in Italy. You'll get a blast out of this. Whoops. Which is Hatikva being played. I'm sorry, now I've lost it. But it's Hatikva being played in Italy with our U18 team at the European uh, Championship qualifiers. Mm. Well, um, tune in uh, on July 29th and 30th, uh, right at 5 a.m. and you'll get to hear that experience. It might not be so emotional when we're just waking up before coffee. Um, but I'm gonna keep moving on because I do wanna offer a couple words about the uh, history of, that I'm aware of, of baseball in Israel. And I'm gonna only give a Mike Glasser version, which is not complete. But I, you know, I, I know that one of the most significant accomplishments was done in a kibbutz called Kibbutz Gezer in the 80s where a, 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 an American, a, a group of Americans in the early 70s settled this uh, kibbutz, which was su struggling at the time. And they made this a more American kibbutz. And that one day they decided to create a, this baseball field. And, they, and you know, it's, it's worth looking up um, it, it, to learn how quickly they did it and how this really initiated a passion in Israel for not only baseball, but softball and helped introduce the sport. In the late early 90s, I had the pleasure of being introduced by Mitch's grandfather to a, uh, a friend of mine who might be on this call, Randy Kahn, who's in the New York Mets jacket on the right. And he had his own ideas uh, along with his father of, of bringing baseball to Israel, a youth baseball. And among his many successes was learning that the Ethiopian refugees loved the sport. And I brought in these, this, these pictures right before the, the Gulf War in 1992, I think, um, that we in, in Jerusalem had a game with the uh, Americans uh, in the mission to Israel along with these children. It was just a, a magical day. Uh, you can see me with hair bent over there. Moving on to the next picture. Um, there's just a very special young man on the on the left, and um, some of the other players, and and, and it, it was just an incredible experience doing that. Um, so, with that being said, um, I, I would also just like to mention that um, from all this activity in the early '90s, international play began. 
I, I was aware of a competition that United that Israel played Saudi Arabia in 1991. And I was told that was the first time an international competition that an Israeli team played an Arab country, the, the Israel against Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia, of course, consisted mostly of oil, American oil workers, kids. And, um, and I think we learned a lesson from that, that if you want to be a Middle East country playing good baseball, perhaps, you know, pull from overseas. Uh, the score of that first competition, the Hatikva playing against with the Saudi national anthem, uh, Saudi won uh, 44 to nothing. Um, so we fared a lot better over the years. And, and um, so that's the introduction. Let's get onto the real program here. And it's really our honor to meet the, the heroes of the day. And those are our three Olympic athletes. Uh, Stu, would you like to start and uh, talk to Mitch? Sure. I have the honor of introducing uh, Mitch Glasser. Um, Mitch is a, a phenomenal person as well as a fantastic baseball player. And you can see his pictures there. Uh, from his college days and is now playing professional baseball in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, a really wonderful city to visit if you want. And, uh, you know, I can say on a personal level after interacting with Mitch for many years, he is uh, as great of a baseball player is, he's even a better human being. And Mitch, tell us what, what it felt like when you first knew that you had the opportunity to play for the Israeli team. Sure, thanks Stu. Um, thank you for all that and your introduction earlier. That's beautiful. Uh, the first time I heard about representing Israel was I heard about the World Baseball Classic. And then in 2016, I got a call from Jerry Weinstein and he said, hey, we're narrowing down. We have a, a list of players that are Jewish that can play on this World Baseball Classic team. And when he asked if that was something I was interested in, I absolutely, um, I was ecstatic because I've been playing baseball. Of course, when you're playing baseball, your goal is to make it to the major leagues. Um, but now all of a sudden, here's this opportunity to use baseball as a vehicle to, to link my identity as a baseball player and as a Jew. And to play for Israel and something that would bring my, my grandparents, my parents, my family, so much pride, my heritage. So, uh, and to play at the next level of baseball, international baseball, the next level to play with, um, players that, um, some of the best players I've ever played with have been on these international teams. So, uh, just such a great opportunity. So I was, I was excited from the get-go. Um, and then later on the whole Olympic journey started too. You know, Mitch, I, I think the impact that you're having goes even beyond the Olympic team. Uh, for the members of the audience, I was lucky enough to 30 years ago meet my bride who's from South Dakota. And certainly our people are not well represented in South Dakota, but, you know, uh, we follow you. And, and there was a article in the Sioux Falls newspaper, and it mentioned that three of the players from that team are going to the Olympics. And I just wonder the impact it must have when you meet your fellow athletes, not only on your team, but throughout the league and others, you know, what, what it means to them that you're representing the country of Israel in the Olympics and, and how that actually spreads um, better understanding among people of different cultures. Can you speak to that? Sure. There's a, uh, uh, baseball is a tight community and it's always been talked about in baseball clubhouses that it's a, it's a little micro culture of the world where you have your, usually it's your Spanish speakers and, and your, your English speakers is usually how it is in a baseball clubhouse, but so many different sects and communities, different tribes. And usually I'm, I'm the token Jew, uh, but not this year. I actually, you know, I have DJ Sharabi with me who's, who's also played in the, on the Israeli team and played with us. And, um, and then we also have a Dominican player, Charlie Valerio, who's going to be playing for the Dominican Republic. So all three of these players in the American association, we all, all happen to be on the same team. Um, so that's pretty fun, but 
at every, all the umpires in between innings, when we're talking, all the players are always asking, Hey, when are you leaving for the Olympics? And so everyone's so excited to even the fans before games say, Hey, we're following you. We stand with Israel. And so that's really cool to see. I mean, it gives me the goosebumps thinking about it, but all the support from the community, people I don't know, but uh, they feel this, they feel compelled to, to call to me during the game and, 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 speak to that I'm playing for the Israeli team um, and that they support me. So it's always a special feeling. You know, I, you gave me the goosebumps back because I, I, you know, I, I really think what we're seeing here is a bigger impact than you guys marching into that field to represent Israel. And we're seeing building community and through baseball and through sports, so much can happen. And, and, and do you have, do you have a favorite moment? And this is a little bit prepared because we were lucky to have dinner with you. And you, you talked about that one special game during the qualifying. Can you can you tell the audience a little bit about that? Oh, man, I, uh, I remember us talking. And maybe this was uh, referring to the Germany game. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so in the uh, European championships, we were playing. Uh, against team team Germany and this was one of the final games where we were trying to figure out if we were going to be one of the teams that uh, were going to qualify for the Olympic qualifier the next round in Italy and it was not the most people I've ever played in front of there may have been and Asaf and Shlomo can correct me but there may have been 500 people there but playing against the home German crowd um, and in between innings, you have like the European electro dance music going, which is pretty cool. Just this really intense crowd. Everyone is cheering on the German team and, uh, um, and we're playing and it, it, we're going back and forth just one of the more intense games. And not, not that during the game, sure. There's the whole backstory of, you know, Israel versus Germany, but as players, we're not thinking about that. We're just thinking about how important this game is if we want to continue on. And it just so happened to be against Germany. But uh, one of the more intense games I've ever played in just so happened to be against that German team. And uh, we ended up winning it in, in the last inning, if not extra innings, that game. And uh, um, the, what I can remember is after the game, I think I was talking with Blake Galen and he had played in front of, 40,000 fans in the world baseball classic, but he's like that intensity that is even those 500 people, you could feel that there's so something special about that team being together. That was really cool. There's actually a full video of that game. I found it last night. And if anybody wants a link to it, it, it it's, you could feel the intensity. And in fact, you scored the winning run in the 10th inning. Um, I, I remember Let, let's move on to the others. Um, Stu, good questions. Good job. <laughs> Um, it's really my honor to uh, introduce Shlomo Lippitz, who's um, really we have, with him and Asaf, we have two generations of, 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 of Israeli baseball here. Shlomo, you're the older ones. You, you uh, as we'll learn, started playing baseball in the, in the 80s, uh, playing baseball at the age of 10. And, and, and yet through all your experiences, um, Mitch likes to refer to you as the godfather of Israeli baseball. Um, after serving in the Israeli Defense Forces, you played in San Diego Mesa College, becoming the second Israeli to play college baseball, and you even got your fastball up, according to Wikipedia, to 88 miles per hour. I don't know if that needs correction or not, but uh, I'll take it. Of course, you're also known for coming in to pitch the last out in the Euro-African Olympic qualifier, at which brought you guys all to where we are today. Um, also in your, your present life, and I think for quite a few years, you've been the vice president of programming and music director for City Winery in New York, which is something that we bonded over when I met you a couple of years ago, because you liked all my t-shirts, concert t-shirts, and um, you particularly like my Paul Simon one, but I'm not going to give it to you. Uh, um, but anyway, so Shlomo, Tell us what it was like growing up and in, 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 in playing this new sport as a young kid. You're on mute. You got it. There you go. Yeah. Thanks for putting this together. Obviously, this is exciting and it never gets tired to uh, 
talk about this experience and just my journey uh, playing baseball from that 10 year old kid in the photo with a little weird 10 year old, you know, early, early nineties haircut to where I am today, which is, you know, two, two weeks away from arguably the biggest sporting event in the world. Um, so very, very different experiences over the years. Um, I would say, you know, the big thing for me growing up in Israel and playing baseball and being part of that first generation of baseball players is really, when I look back, is being thankful for the labor of love and time that a very few people kind of put into it, kind of, you know, it was parents of kids, it's folks like uh, Randy, like you mentioned, and folks like Jerry and Shai and Peter, who uh, just had a vision and had the time and the love for the game to spend, you know, hours with myself and a very few, you know, small group of kids and just kind of feed the hunger that a kid has playing a sport that they love. You know, the big thing for me was, you know, people ask me, what baseball team did you idolize? What player did you idolize? What were your, some of your favorite, you know, games watching? We did not grow up with any exposure whatsoever to baseball. I mean, I started the love and got the bug for baseball, visiting some family in New York in 1986, watching a Met game and just still have a vivid memory, probably one of them you know, my earliest memories walking into a stadium and, you know, just that, that kind of aura of just that many people in such a big stadium and then coming back and no baseball on TV. Uh, no, you can't walk down to the local bodega and buy baseball cards. Um, no real, you know, can't walk into a sport outlet and choose a cool uniform or a baseball glove or a bat. So we're, uh, using kind of these oversized softball gloves and undersized baseball bats and rigged, you know, baseballs and, and some really cheap t-shirts. And it was very, very pure. And with a small group of people, we would be practicing once a week on Fridays, uh, you know, if the, on soccer fields. Actually, the background of that photo on the right is me and the sport tech, one of the few hubs around the country that uh, had kids playing baseball. And I was just kind of, I, you can't get, couldn't get me off the field. And when I say off the field, meaning there was no, again, there was no mounds, there was no clubhouses, there's nothing. So it it's, was very, very uh, basic, but, you know, I was lucky enough to have enough people around me to, uh, send that first team that you talked about to Germany and, you know, lose pretty badly and uh, still want to play, wanted to play baseball after that tough loss. And I feel so lucky because I've really, you know, when Mitch says the Godfather in, in a way it is because I've seen it in, through its whole combination. I've, I've played on the first national team when I was 10 years old. I kept playing till I was 18. I was one of the first people who got, uh, was allowed to play baseball throughout my military service. I was one of the first people who played college. I then was lucky enough to go come back, kind of a big home, homecoming in 2007 and playing in the IBL, the first profession, first and only professional baseball season in Israel's history. Um, played some well. pro, played some pro ball. Well yeah. Yeah, did very well. And this is, you know, and, and just, you know, just a snapshot when I left, Israel when I was 21, two weeks after the end of my military service, where most of my friends went and did a track in India or South America, I walked on as a completely unknown uh, to Mesa College and basically presented myself saying, hey, my name is Shlomo, probably the first Shlomo they've ever met. Uh, mm -hmm. I want to play baseball on your team. So it must have been a culture shock for them as much as it was for me. And since at that time I was really not up to par as far as level of baseball, I did use what the little few tools that I did have in my toolbox. You know, the fact that I played international ball, uh, my maturity level, the fact that I, you know, did three years in the military, my nickname 
my first couple of years in college was Sarge just because I was in the military. So, you know, I used that to kind of get me on the team. And then uh, my talent was so raw, I guess, you know, I was not throwing curveballs and uh, throwing, I wasn't on travel ball five days a week, like many Americans do now and kind of the rear and tear in my arm. So I really, without any artificial help was able to, uh, like you said, go from, a low 70s fastball to 88, 89 fastball just in a couple of years, just by throwing every day. Well, let, me, um, let me interrupt you and say that that face, that picture of you in a Dodgers uniform, that's a tool. That, that would have intimidated me if I was hitting against you. Yeah, but again, notice what this actually photo was taken in the, World Street, in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, I'm a Dodger shirt, but a Yankee hat. That was, oh, just, a, that. That was just an amateur move from my side. Uh, <laughs> I didn't even notice. Stu, would you like to uh, introduce us to the South? I would, but Shlomo, I want to tell you, as the grandfather of Israeli baseball, I think you're going to have many, many offspring, because I think what you guys are doing as a team is going to really affect a lot of young Israeli children and American children and Jews throughout the world to want to be involved in this great sport that we all love. So thank you for all you've done. And uh, we really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. I mean, every single player on this team is is a role model for a young kid uh, in Israel. And it's true. I mean, you could see just in the faces of the seven or eight Israelis, young Israelis that have come and joined us in this camp, just how much they look up to every single player. And they now see a path, you know, uh, of, you know, where they could go and what can they become, which is great. Well, I can tell you, I'll be watching you and I hope to visit you someday at the winery and uh, pour me a little extra just because I was a moderator, okay? You got it. Well, it is my great honor to introduce Asaf Loengart. And Asaf is an incredibly young man who is an Israeli who is now playing baseball at Mansfield University in the great state of Pennsylvania. And he has told us about his journey when he was traveling through the US on a whistle stop trip to train trip to see new baseball opportunities. And he was actually has been coaching an under 14 national team as well as the Israeli working at the Israeli Baseball Academy. And he's been through um, places and visited like Delta College out in Stockton, California, a great place and places through in Seattle, Divine Baseball Academy, and is now currently, when not um, representing Israel on the Olympic team, playing and studying in college in Mansfield University. And Asaf, we want to congratulate you. We know that this last year, as a shortstop, you hit 11 home runs, which is, by the way, 11 more home runs than Mike Glasser ever hit in his <laughs> entire life. And probably one of the best position players ever to come out of Israel. And Asaf, uh, congratulations. We are so proud of you. And I'd like to know, what was the experience like as a child playing baseball in Israel? Uh, first of all, thanks for the introduction and putting this all together. Um, so I started playing baseball when I was about 11 or 12 years old. Um, I just saw it on TV, asked my parents if I could go play. And they told me to look it up online, see if I can find a team. Obviously, they didn't expect me to find anything. Fortunately for them, I found a team in Kibbutz Gezer, which was baseball, basically started in, in Israel. Um, and I started playing once a week, uh, really no understanding of the game. Even the, my first game ever, I was I got to first base on a hit. I don't know how I did it. Got to first base. Next next guy up hits a ball to second base, and I didn't run to second base because I didn't want to get tagged because the ball was there. Obviously, I had to run because I was on first base. So that was my first ever uh, game. That's how much I knew about baseball. And then um, my coach told me to try for the national team. Obviously, I didn't make it because I didn't know anything about baseball, but I really wanted to try again because representing Israel is one of the biggest achievements for an Israeli. Um, so 
I went to Tel Aviv baseball where they had more coaches. All of them were national team uh, players. Dan Rotham, O. Gottlieb, um, Amit Kurtz, Peter, Peter Sun, Ophir Katz, all I looked up to because they were the guys I wanted to be at the end. Um, so I started playing baseball in Tel Aviv. My parents drove me 45 minutes twice a week to practice a sport that they didn't even know anything about. Um, at the same time, I was also playing other sports, basketball, soccer, tennis. Slowly those faded away as I made the national team and saw the opportunity I have to represent Israel. And that's all I want to do and all I want to do. And that's what I've been doing ever since. Um, got to the age of 18, drafted to the military as a sport I, um, athlete status in the military. Uh, thanks to Shlomo Lippitz and Dan Rotham and guys like that, that paved the way for me and Tal and the four sport IEs that athletes in the military that we have now. Um, I was able to keep practicing and play in Czech Republic and Germany and go to the US and try out for teams, uh, college teams. And yeah, that's my story. Just found it on TV. <laughs> you know, um, I have two questions for you. The first one is because uh, what was your favorite moment during the, the qualifying experience. And number two, what's it like playing on a team, a college team, and how your teammates have reacted to the fact that you're going to be an Olympian in representing the state of Israel? Um, so for me, the, I would say craziest moment in this whole uh, qualifying process was Shlomo's last uh, last pitch to to get like put us to the in the Olympics, seeing Shlomo Lipitz, a guy who the godfather of Israel baseball, a guy that for me until about I was 17 when I made the the senior national team, I only heard stories about and never knew him because again he was playing overseas. So seeing that um, was. I can't even explain it. I was, I don't even know if I was crying or laughing or I was just jumping up and down and it was amazing. Um, to your second question, uh, I don't think anybody knows how to react to having a future Olympian next to him. I, I don't know how to react to be a future Olympian. So I think the whole thing is very, very weird. Um, even guys that I played against and umpires and other coaches that I ran, um, ran into in games, they talked to me and I was like, how do you know even? Like, who knows about this whole thing? And I guess everybody knows. And as I can see, there's about 45 people that are in this Zoom call. So it's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, I don't think anybody knows yet how to react. I don't know if anybody will. I don't, I don't know how to react. Well, um, so, yeah. One of the amazing things to me, um, uh, that I learned that the delegation that's going to the Olympics, that you will have as much security personnel there as you will actually have athletes. And, and I think that drives home to me the importance of what this means in the world, in the way the world is right now. So I want to congratulate all of you for representing the state of Israel and all of us. And I can't thank you enough. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. I, and, and I want to say that Shlomo, no matter what happens uh, in Olympics, has already achieved the absolute pinnacle of success in baseball. We'll explain at the very end of this session in 20 minutes. So uh, stand by, because he's truly it, it has an incredible accomplishment, which we'll share with you. Um, so we're a little, running a little behind schedule, but I, so um, it, it's very important we learn a little bit from Peter Kurtz, who's uh, presently the general manager of Israel Baseball and formerly the president. We're here today because of Peter. Uh, Peter, are you there? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Okay, I, I don't see you, but um, I imagine everybody else can. So we're going to make this abbreviated, but this is your vision. And can you share with us the vision and, and if you can wrap it up in a couple of minutes, tell us, how did you do this? 
a couple of minutes is a little bit uh, short for that. No, but give us three, all, or, three or four. How's that? I just wanted to say, first of all, what nachas it is. Anybody who knows Yiddish knows what the word nachas is to see these three guys, um, each one a little bit different in the way they approach baseball, they approach Israel baseball, but seeing all three of them talking about their own personal journeys, their own personal successes, um, and how it all comes together in one group success. So, I mean, it, it, it takes, it's one simple word. I just want to grow baseball in Israel. That's the main thing, to grow baseball in Israel. What's the best way to grow baseball in Israel? There's some people who say from the bottom up and some say from the top down, and I believe on the top down. So we had this ability to reach um, where we could reach in the WBC and in the Olympic qualifiers. That's a great cap you have on there um, with, our, with our logo there. Um, but we had the, 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 the opportunity to get to the Olympics. Um, we put together this team, which has gotten us there. The summer of 2019 will be an incredible summer to remember. Um, four tournaments in the, in the span of 10 weeks, um, four victories in those four tournaments and reaching finally the Olympic qualifiers with Shlomo throwing out, uh, out that last pitch. Thank you, Maggie, for, for the translation of the word nachis. I appreciate that for all those who don't understand it. Uh, I'm also kveling. So you can look up and see what kveling is in Yiddish. Um, but, but this vision of, of growing baseball in Israel is definitely through guys that are shown here to the rest of our players, achieving a medal in the Olympics and doing another thing, building fields in Israel. Because with the JNF, with the Jewish National Fund, we've succeeded in, in, in building fields today. Now tractors are working on new fields. There's one baseball field in Israel, one basic baseball field, or one and a half baseball fields because the field in Gezer, I call a half a field because it was actually a softball field that was later expanded to baseball. So the, in the middle of center field is a light pole. Um, but the guys play on that anyway. So we're building fields right now in Renana and in, uh, in Beit Shemesh. Um, and together with those fields, together with the Olympic medal that I hope we get, there's Kreling also, fantastic. Um, we can really the, double and triple the number of players in Israel, yes. Tell us about the vision of, of, and how do you put together a team to compete in the European Championship and be competitive? How did you do this? You just, you look, it's, it's looking for Jewish players is like looking for a needle in a haystack. Looking for Israeli players is like looking for the head of the needle in a haystack. Um, it's not easy. Mitch came and made Aliyah after he was with us in the WBC. The rules are a little bit different than the WBC, but to play in the Olympics, you have to be an Israeli national. You have to hold a passport. And when I approached the 10 guys from the WBC team and I asked them if they wanted to come make Aliyah and become Israeli citizens, which is a major step, which is a major decision-making step, everyone said yes, including Mitch, and they all readily came and made Aliyah and became Israeli citizens. They asked questions about the army service, about taxes, and things like that, which are logical. Um, but emotionally, they were all there. They played for is with Israel across their chest, and they really wanted to continue this journey. And they and they did it. And they came and they've done it. Well, that's great. And you've a, a gathered an incredible um, collection of players who are great baseball players and fine human beings. I, I had a pleasure of getting to know many of them. Um, so I, I wish we had more time to get more into it. But look, I'm going to quickly take us through this 2019 experience to show this path that is team Israel followed to get there. I think Mitch told me when you first presented him with this chance to compete in the European tournament, there was a 5% chance for hands of landing an Olympic bid. It started, and I'm going to just take us through this very quickly. Um, it started with the pool B. There's a, a pool A, there was one slot available for the victor in the pool B. There were two divisions of pool B. This was the first one. And um, Israel, we had no idea how we would be doing in Blagojegrad, Bulgaria against these teams. It turned out that we were very equal with Team Russia. And uh, uh, Shlomo, if you can quickly, um, Maggie, can you go to the next slide? Uh, sh share with us um, your memories from either of these two games. The, the July 4th one was unbelievable, as you can see by the back score. Yeah, thank you. I mean, just a quick note, Russia actually just beat Belarus two days ago, and uh, they will be competing in Pool A. So obviously, they have a really strong team. And the, the two Russian-Israel games that we played in Bulgaria, for me, you know, it's so easy to get lost in, you know, the end results of where we are right now. But throughout this four tournaments we played in, there were so many small moments that could have played 
played out differently that would have prevented us from getting there. And really early on, these two games, you know, were just so close. I mean, you could see yourself uh, by the box score, just kind of how back and forth we were. We, you know, just that uh, July 4th game, you know, we beat Russia 13 to 12. Uh, look at that last frame. We They scored four runs in 10th inning. We thought we were down and over. I, mean, I remember very vividly warming up in the bullpen and just thinking, man, this is over. We're just going to, you know, we're going to do what we have done in the past, which is get very, very close and not be able to deliver. And then just a mixture of a great hit by uh, Rosenbaum and a couple of errors, uh, a pass ball, uh, uh, an odd decision by the Russian coach to take someone out. And that person had two wild pitches. Uh, that was a, a massive emotional roller coaster. And then not even, let's see, two days later, again, in the finals, uh, give up two runs in the eighth inning were, you know, basically tied and then coming back in the ninth, in the bottom of the ninth and scoring three runs and, and winning it, it was, uh, I think that's when we started to believe that maybe our, our T-shirt that said the road to Tokyo uh, is, is one that is, is achievable for us because I think that was a major, not only physical, but also psychological obstacle. Uh, as someone who's played for the national team for so many years, and I'm sure Asaf could attest to it, we've always had this kind of underdog mentality but with folks like Mitch and folks like then Danny and now Ian it, it's it's those people that that new fresh you know uh, approach and attitude that really I think helped change around 180 degrees just our approach from like hey we may be able to make it we're the underdog to we belong here and we could do this and I think you know just a transition into two weeks before the Olympics, I don't think anyone in the team is content with just being there. I think every single one on that team, including myself, including, of course, Peter, uh, believe that we could achieve something special beyond just participating. And, uh, and that means only one thing, which is some type of color medal, you know, right. whether it be gold, silver, or bronze. Uh, I think we're up to the task and we've proved it. Well, I'll remember, never forget that home run by Simon Rosenbaum that um, tied the game uh, at 3-3 in the bottom of the eighth. And then two wild pitches uh, gave us a, a cushion, uh, the lead and then a cushion and the victory. Uh, when you prevailed uh, at Pool B Championship, then you had to play the winner of the other uh, Pool B, which was Lithuania. Can you go to the next slide? I'm going to go quickly through this. Um, but there was a three game best of three series. You had to fly all the way back from America, go back to Lithuania in order to qualify for the A level. Asaf, can you just really quickly tell us what kind of facilities you played in in Lithuania? Yeah, so the field was inside a host track stadium. And then the field itself was built a couple of days before we arrived. The They said, I think the uh, the dugouts, which were just benches with a little bit of a rooftop, were built two days before we arrived. So that was what we went into. Um, and I liked that. It. it was a decent field for a week old field. So it was pretty good. All right. So we're going to move on. You prevailed in that series. Then you went to the European Championship. The winner of Pool A, five of these teams would then advance to the uh, Olympic qualifier. And um, it, this, you could see the game against Germany is what Mitch described earlier. Um, there were some powerhouses here, the Netherlands, a, a, a perpetual powerhouse with many players from Curacao, I believe. Italy developed a tradition in baseball after World War II with American servicemen there. Uh, Germany and Spain were also very strong. And we finished fourth in the European Championship Pool A to advance to the next round which was the Olympic qualifier, the European uh, Euro Africa Olympic qualifier in incredible cities, Parma and Bologna, Italy. One of these teams is going to advance into the world, to the World Series, to the Olympics. The other is, uh, opportunity to go to another round to try to qualify. 
Um, Mitch, just real quickly, any reactions or feelings when you see the screen? Yeah, it was pretty wild because uh, it makes me think of all these little, all these levels we had to get by. And uh, I think I told Peter this, but I remember being on the phone and in the fall of 2018, when Peter called me and said, hey, would you be interested in representing Israel? What Peter alluded to before. And I was like, well, what do you think the chances are of us actually making it? And he's like, oh, well, you know, if we win pool B, probably 25%. If we move in that, probably 20% gets the next round, then probably five. 10%. So probably all in all a 5% chance. And, uh, but he believed it 5% is still possible. And sure enough, uh, we were not the best team on paper. Um, but we, it seemed like every single time we got a guy in base, there was a timely hit. Um, every single chance, even if we made a mistake, we were ready for the next opportunity. All of our pitchers, everyone was just playing out of their mind and just playing for, to win playing for each other. And so that was really fun to be a part of. So looking at all these games and, uh, and getting to play in Parma and Bologna, the only way my wife wasn't able to make it to any of the uh, Maggie wasn't able to make it to any of the previous locations. She said, the only way she's coming is if we make it to Italy. I'm like, Oh, well, I don't really know if we're going to make it to Italy. So uh, I'd say that was my motivation to make sure we made it to Italy. And sure enough, we got Maggie to come to uh, Parma and Bologna um, so she was holding out for Italy and she got it and, and we qualified. All right. We, we have five more minutes and, uh, or six minutes and Peter's going to, uh, I, I f finish up, uh, before we explain, uh, make some final announcements, but, um, Stu, do you have any final questions and give, uh, each of our players, uh, uh, the, their last say, the last minute to offer any thoughts? No, I think that there's nothing that I could add that this panel hasn't already added. And just please, when I mentioned about the need for all the security, we need to support this team both financially and emotionally. And so I reach out to the attendees to please uh, think about supporting this team. Michael, you have to unmute yourself. Michael, you have to unmute yourself. I can tell you knowing Mike for 55 years, we've all wanted him muted. <laughs> <laughs> um, Peter, why don't you uh, tell us more about the future of baseball in Israel and the, your work with the JNF? Okay, well, right now we have uh, close to a thousand players um, playing baseball in Israel. Certainly the last year and a half has been challenging with the corona, um, just as in the rest of the world, Israel was also given a blow with corona, um, and a lot of our players were not able to play. But we're hoping that, that this Olympic uh, participation can really give a, a jump and a boost to the, to the um, Israeli baseball program. Um, we know a lot of kids out back in Israel are going to be watching the Olympics. It is, it's a, the first two games, by the way, um, for people who want to follow them, are the 29th and the 30th of July. Um, we're playing Korea and then the United States at uh, 6 a.m. Um, Eastern time, which I guess is 5 a.m. And uh, oh, here's, here's the, the slide, which I get. Oh, okay, here we go. 5 a.m. Central time. Um, thank you for that. Um, so we're really hoping that this will jumpstart the program in Israel. And by September, when we start up again, we'll have a lot more kids coming out. As I mentioned, um, we've spent about the last 10 years raising funds for building fields. Um, building fields is hugely important. Um, the old adage of if you build it, they will come is completely true. When a kid comes for the first time and sees a beautiful green field of field of, of baseball, he's just taken by it. I mean, really taken by it. Our two main centers are Beit Shemesh and Renana. Um, right now, in this example in Beit Shemesh, they don't play in the middle of Beit Shemesh, but they play in all kinds of kibbutzim and moshevim around Beit Shemesh. So we're now building a field in the middle of Beit Shemesh. And kids can come there with their bicycles and they can walk there and they can take buses there. And that's going to be a lot easier than parents having to transport them all the time. So that's our one, our one facility that we're building right now with the uh, IAB funding um, together with the Jewish National Fund, together with the JNF, um, who are real supporters of ours since for the last 10 years. The second field is in Renana, which is just north of Tel Aviv, where also um, we had a field there and it was taken away from a, by a housing project. Um, but we have a, 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 the possibility of, uh, with the municipality, they're supporting us totally. And we're now building together with the municipality, both a, a baseball field and a soccer field. The outfit will be a soccer field. 
and the infield and the rest of the thing is, is baseball. Um, and we're doing it together with them. So there's some funding from them, but there's also funding uh, um, from, from the IAB and from the JNF. We're also looking to develop more fields in Modi'in. Anybody who knows about Israel in Modi'in, the center of the country, also up in the north of Israel, the more fields we have there, the more kids will be coming out. And we're really hopeful that by um, 2022, we can have 2,000, 2,500, maybe 3,000 kids playing baseball in Israel. And that will be an incredible, an incredible leap forward um, for the program. I know some of you have donated funds through the JNF platform that we have set up for this. Um, we also obviously need funding for this team. Um, unfortunately, the Israeli government, anybody who knows about the Israeli government knows that until a month ago, we had about five governments over the last two years. And the only budget that they were working on was the 2018 budget. And we had qualified in 2019. So we weren't uh, involved in that budget at all. Um, not in the current Israeli budget. We've gotten some money from the, uh, from the sports ministry but it's about 20% of the funding that we need for this team. And that's why we're also raising money, raising money for this team through the JNF. Well, I have to say um, among the many benefits of this program, what I was able to watch was the role of ambassador that the Israeli team played in Europe and all of your international teams going out there, meeting uh, folks from other parts of Europe, other parts of the world, uh, it puts a human face on who Israelis are and our competitive spirit and our mensch-like qualities that were continually um, exhibited uh, throughout all the travel. And the program allows that kind of interaction to happen and, 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 and one of the many benefits of this program. Um, it's, we're down to our last minute. I, I'd like to make a couple final announcements and we'll talk about uh, uh, this. Here it is, the pinnacle of uh, Shlomo's success. He's got a bobblehead. Look at this. I saw this last night. I ordered one. <laughs> uh, you can order a, a Shlomo uh, bobblehead and other uh, merchandise um, uh, through this uh, website right here. So that's one thing. And of course, here's the link uh, to donate to Team Israel. Um, if you can have uh, support the, the, this team and, and their travel and uh, the, the projects that Peter uh, described, please um, help out this wonderful initiative. Um, I just want to mention maybe that Randy Kahn has just put a message in the, in the chat. So he was here. I think he heard that. And a real shout out to Randy for really starting the baseball program in Israel 30 plus years ago. And uh, we're just building now on that, on that basic platform that he allowed us to have. Well, Randy's dedication is amazing, and uh, thank you for acknowledging that. Um, do uh, what, Mitch, would you like to just share with us what you've got going on in the next uh, week prior to leaving for Tokyo? You're muted. Uh, we have some games in the Northeast. Uh, Peter could probably summarize a lot quicker than me, but uh, we'll be playing some games and some tune-up games before we leave for Tokyo. Uh, getting ready for the opening ceremonies and, uh, and the Olympics. But thank you uh, to my father for putting this together. This has really been amazing. And all your support, everyone. Uncle Stu, appreciate it. Uh, Peter Shlomo Asaf, thank you so much. And my wife, Maggie, also for being behind the scenes. So uh, you guys are all awesome and so much support. It, it just awesome reading through the chat and seeing all these notes. I can't wait to see you guys. Um, and... Uh, Thank you so much again. And, and Maggie, if we could send that link for the site to donate to all the attendees would be phenomenal. Shlomo, well, I'm gonna, um, well, first Asaf, your last word, and then Shlomo, the last word, Asaf. Um, just thank you, Mike, for setting this up and thanks for everybody who showed up. Okay, um, unless Peter or Mitch wants to grab it, we're giving Shlomo or Stu, we're giving Shlomo the last word, go for it. El Israel. <laughs> Translate. There you go. Just, uh, go, go Israel. Thanks, All right. everyone. All right. Thank great. you, everybody. This is wonderful. And good luck and have a great time. I'll see you guys in Hartford, Connecticut on Wednesday. Take care. You're done. Thank you, guys. All right. What a... Stu, thanks.